Hi, welcome to this uh, presentation in the Identity Manager Unknown Unknown series. I'm Rob Byrne, I'm a field strategist at One Identity, and our subject in this session is analytics, identity analytics, the capabilities in Identity Manager, and perhaps a touch of machine learning. So we're going to go through some of the existing uh, features or capabilities of Identity Manager around reporting, analytics, and some, some of the newer stuff you may not have had a chance to look at yet. So what's interesting in this presentation, think of it as perhaps a refresher on what's already there. Maybe you haven't had a chance to sit down and look at it or you haven't been back to it for a while. Um, and let's uh, think again, uh, reconsider a little bit, take the time to think how we can get value from existing metrics analytics reports uh, you know kpis are already present in the platform and how we can get most value from that so that's what we're going to talk about today in terms of the topics uh just a brief i would say overview on what, what we mean by analytics and a little bit you know its relationship to machine learning and artificial intelligence as well then specifically the topics i've broken it down into th those three topics so access reporting so reporting for access recommendations and this is where a little bit of intelligence oriented analytics uh, comes in and then more like insights and alerts so rather than just dumping you know report on me point me or or show me things that perhaps i wasn't expecting and and that kind of surfacing of valuable information certainly you know has a, has a lot of value in the product so there are the topics we're, we're going to cover um so let's let's get started so what what do we mean by you know ml uh, machine learning artificial intelligence well in, in a similar way that uh, you can you know talk about blockchain and ask you know what that is and so on uh blockchain if you look at it's an implementation of like as a data structure as of a Merkle tree, which is a binary tree where there's hashing used, you know, so that all the different nodes in the tree have got the higher layers, which gives you a kind of a tamper proofing uh, capability. So you can categorize blockchain as it's in its abstract way as, you know, a Merkle tree. ML, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, in a similar way, it essentially comes down to computational statistics using algorithms to you know, tease and squeeze information and insight from from data so it kind of makes it sound like there's nothing new there which is is you know unfair uh, what's new is the algorithms the new techniques that are being used in computational statistics the fact that we now have more computing power large data sets that allows those algorithms to actually you know give us give us value in, in reasonable amounts of time and what, are, what are these algorithms doing they're counting, they're filtering, they're aggregating, you know, the best fitting, and kind of, you know, linear regression, which is that thing where you fit a line to a, a set of data data points. They're clustering and grouping. We think about that for, for role mining in our context. You know, the baselining, so watching and measuring metrics and baselining what's normal. They're adjusting, adapting behaviors, you know, tuning uh, parameters to, to optimize performance, uh, kind of self-regulating over time. So these are the kinds of things that they're doing. So these techniques uh, promise us, uh, you know, a lot. And, in t you know, in terms of, you know, becoming more human, allowing us easier interaction with these systems. So natural language processing, you know, image recognition, you know, autonomous vehicles, these are all the energy savings, right? If the system in the house knows that I'm not at home at certain times, it learns this. Uh, so, you know, reduced operational headaches uh, in, in computer systems and so on. So intelligent things could, could, be, could be everywhere. You know, things like you know, one that, you know, won't burn your dinner, uh, you know, a pot that won't boil over, uh, you know, all these these kind of things. So I haven't explicitly told it not to undercook the cake, you know, and, and or overcook the cake. And, and so it will know that, you know, what the right amount actually is. Now, in our world of identity and access, uh, the promise here, if we kind of project, extrapolate to the future is, 
you know, zero maintenance of operations, kind of self-healing databases, elastic load balancing for, for services, processes that will, you know, adapt to the load that the system is under. And from access management point of view, you know, secure, seamless, just-in-time access for anything, anytime, anywhere. I mean, these, these are the promises. These are big promises to make. And it's, it's, of course, something to aim for. Um, in terms of the machine learning AI technology, we've had questions, hey, is it in a state where it's it's kind of fit for purpose for, you know, what the kind of things that it's been used for? Well, we know that like all new technology, you know, there's still problems, still needs to be tweaks or, you know, with this type of technology, a lot of false negatives can, can happen. Um, in terms of these algorithms, particularly, you know, the machine learning ones, they need to be trained, right? And then with the training and the data sets that are used, you can inject bias into these systems. This is one of the big problems with this data. So if you have poor data quality or bias, biased data training the algorithms, that's going to be a problem. So, you know, you can look at uh, great examples like the Microsoft chatbot that, uh, you know, learned and grew over time, which was Great, except it grew and learned to be a foul-mouthed racist, right? In these, uh, you know, forums that that it that they had, in, you know, introduced it to, and that had to be, you know, um, chopped, uh, removed, didn't go too well. Amazon and IBM, interestingly, have recently announced that they've suspended face recognition work and and R and D on those in those areas and the and the services around. Uh, concerns around regulation that's currently unknown and, and a fear of abuse and bias in these systems. So, you know, the technology is still you know, very much like, you know, an early adopter stage. And, you know, the self-driving cars, which are not really self-driving, well, they are self-driving, but still needs the person to, you know, to govern and to be responsible. Uh, we know that it could both ways, right? They've saved people in, in tricky accident situations, but it's also gone the other way. If we've relied on them too much, they've actually you know caused caused problems because they're not the technology is not in a good enough state at the moment so that's that but the other thing that can go wrong with uh, data sets is that uh, the data uh, can you know when we come down to actually interpret the data and use the data that we can get into into difficulties so the first example i have there is around uh, extrapolation so it's dangerous to extrapolate on data we know this so misinterpretation, misuse of data, you know, sat nav, uh, you know, pretty, pretty smart system. But if it points in a straight line across a, you know, a, a water channel as a way to get me from A to B is the quickest route, then, you know, uh, am I going to follow that blindly or am I going to do the right thing? Um, you know, the other, another example would be um, something, something like this, which I found an interesting case. Um, they used uh, during the war, during one of the many European wars, uh, they used, um, they had a look at the airplanes coming back from missions and they had a look at it. And the question was, hey, how can we better protect our airplanes? Let's have a look at the statistical distributions of these bullet holes. And the initial reaction was to say, well, you know, logically, we're going to put some more armor around those spots that are typically being hit. And, you know, and of course, there's a cost, right, added weight, so less less range and fuel, so there's a trade-off there. And it was actually a Hungarian uh, engineer or mathematician who pointed out, actually, it was totally the wrong way to look at it, that, in fact, what we should really do, it, because the airplanes that don't come back are the ones that have been hit in the other places, right, so the places where there are gaps. So really what we should be doing is reinforcing those other areas around the engine, around the pilot cockpit, you know, around the wings where you know, perhaps there's fuel stored and so on. That makes it very, very sensitive. So interpreting and making use of the data sets, even when we have them and even when they're totally reliable, you get the plane sitting in front of you, uh, we, we need to be careful about, about how we use them. So this is it's all a little bit, you know, just setting the stage for, you know, a little bit of an overview. There's a, there's a whole topic there of... of you know, where, where a little bit we are with this machine learning, artificial intelligence and interpretation of data. So we're going to move on, obviously, to talk specifically around Identity Manager. And I wanted to break this down, as I said, into those three categories of reporting, recommending and, uh, you know, uh, offering insights and, and alerting. And 
if you take a look at identity managers to open up the web login as a as somebody with an auditor role, you know, so an access access to a lot of of information, actually all information. Log in there, you'll get a whole bunch of default dashboards, a whole bunch of default reports, a whole bunch of default information. Perhaps there's too much information. And the real question, I think, is who is this information for and what kind of information are they particularly interested in? So in terms of the category of access reporting, uh, you know, keep on over it. So who benefits from access reporting? So the approach I want to take here to try and help us cut this down and think about it in the right way is to think about the persona. So I have a persona driven approach. So the first type of persona that will be interested in reporting, I think or probably the others, right, would be person and organization managers. What does my team have access to? What kind of access has my organization got? Tell me who's recently joined, who's recently left, who's recently moved you know, around the organization. These people will be interested in status of, of access, status of, of alerts, and trends, uh, the, move, the movements. In terms of the risk compliance officers, those people interested in those subjects, system administrators, kinds of reports they'll be interested in, orphans and outliers. You know, my experience, these are typically the, the first reports that we should we, we bring out from a project. Typically within the first couple of months, we can start to to issue these reports and already show some value to that class of user. Hey, you've got lots of orphan accounts. That's a risk. Oh yeah, it is. Um, lots of native changes. Certainly, if there are a lot of native changes, perhaps that's normal because we don't have a system in place right now, but we should definitely start to measure that and then be able to show value over time as the native changes get reduced. Sleepers, right? So dormant accounts. That's that's obviously the accounts that are, that are existing but unused. So here's just a couple of samples of status and trends type reports that we have a standard in identity manager you have one here that's a employee overview with, with history so you get the full access information for any employee and of course you can generate it for all employees in a team as well so you have that information right at your fingertips the profile and all the access they've got including the historical information that's that's super powerful uh, super useful to show to auditors uh, for for the risk compliance uh, crowd, but for the manager as well, just to see what access uh, you know his people have. In terms of the trends and the status, there are plenty of dashboards available that are showing you know trending around your organization. Uh, in terms of the size of it, in terms of uh, you know events that are that are happening around it. So those are all the kinds of kinds of things. In terms of the trends, there may be trends that are of specific interest to to you or to you know, organizations that you're working with. Of course, we can add a dashboard showing that trending easily in, in, into the web portal. We can, we can extend this reporting. Now, in terms of the risk uh, compliance officers, those orphan accounts, very easy with connected systems to generate that information. And of course, you can drill down into each system and see what, what those accounts are. Put that on the desk of, you know, each of the system owners and say, we need to talk about this. How are we going to mitigate, uh, you know, these 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 accounts? Sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, the outliers. Well, what's an outlier? An outlier is potentially an indicator of entitlement creep. You know, it, show me all the accounts. You can see here. You know, there's a threshold, a configurable threshold. So there's like fifteen hundred odd accounts here, and thirty one of them are like way, you know, out of kilter with respect to everybody else. Maybe that's normal. Maybe it's not, right? But it just certainly deserves uh, to be looked at. And of course, we, again, we can drill down and see what those accounts are. So you immediately, when you see this, think of of other questions to ask. Okay, are these outliers are they growing over time, or actually, am I converging to some kind of norm in in the solution? So I'd like to see the trends, and I definitely, in terms of a KPI, I want to see that decreasing. Okay, so that the project can can claim improvements. What about uh, outlier groups? Here we're looking at accounts. What about outlier groups? Groups that have abnormal, you know, memberships in them. Is that growing or decreasing over time? Especially, for example, the domain admin account is uh, group. Sorry, is that growing over time or is that decreasing? Is it fluctuating? What's going on with that? 
So having a vision onto that. And this is all data that we can, we can some of these reports out here are obviously the ones I'm showing out of the box. And some of that data is, is really just below the surface. It's certainly easily accessible to us. So there's enormous value just in extracting this existing reports and data from, from the solution. In terms of the natives, native changes, there's a report you know, any cha native changes in Active Directory. It's, it's you know, obviously for obvious reasons, interesting to see that. And then the sleepers, the dormant accounts, those accounts that are, you know, still littering my environment and that are causing, you know, increasing the attack surface there and, and a big risk if any of those get compromised. And all the more so that they're dormant and sleepers and oh, they're not being used, it's perhaps easy to forget about them. Maybe they drop off other dashboards. So they, they do need to be, they do need to be addressed. We had uh, a conversation recently with a CISO who told us that he still receives, uh, he gets messages on LinkedIn from old uh, employees that left the company saying, hey, it's a bit weird. Uh, I still seem to have access to some of those systems. Uh, you know, people that come back and find that they get rehired and find they still have access. So, you know, there's a lot of scope out there in the world to, to, to look at these metrics and make improvements in organizations and an enormous value there. What about access recommendations? We're moving on from just pure reporting to, hey, system, you're supposed to be smart. You're supposed to have intelligence. Make some recommendations for me. What, what can we do? Again, let's take a persona-oriented approach because there's so much we could talk about. Requester and approvers, what kind of recommendations can we, can we make to a business user making a request to an approver approving a request? Same question for a, cert and a, and a tester, somebody who has to certify access or certify that you're still in the same team. Can the system help a bit with that? Exception remediators. Oh dear, oh, there's a lot of violations on my plate this week. Hey, identity manager, can you help me to, to manage those violations and make recommendations around remediations? I'm a role administrator. Can you recommend to me some new roles? That, that I can put in place that will make everybody's life easier and take some of the pain out of granting access, out of reviewing and certifying access. That's right. So, you know, the, the traditional view of, of what we can present from a density access management point of view is, is, you know, who's got the access, what, when, why, and so on. And let's try to move to a situation where the system is saying, hmm, maybe this guy should have this access or should not have this access. So let's have a look at some things we can do here. So one of the things, and you know, if you if you scratch the surface of machine learning, which is a technology, as, as we've discussed, if you scratch the surface, what people really want from it is uh, intelligent, adaptive automation, making their life easier, right? That's, that's what they want. So here's a requester. He's logging into the web portal. Hey, let's, let's, and the product offers this a standard. Let's offer him an express checkout. So let's minimize the number of clicks he's got to make to move to, first, you know, to find already the access he wants and then to move through to submitting that access. So in the express checkout, there's, there's several things we, we can offer uh, here. We're going to run through each of them. And the first one we'll have a look at is the notion of popular items. So you drill, you, you click into the popular items section, and what we're seeing here is items that you can request, that this, this person can request, that are commonly requested by people in his team or in his organization, or people that report to the same manager. So that's the so-called peer group. So these are items that other people in your team have, have requested. And you know some of them you may already have, some of them you may not be authorized to have, but definitely some of them you might want to request. Okay, so that's a great way to recommend to a requester things that they, they probably you know, uh, need or, or it's likely that they would need. Here we move on to another recommendation for the requester, which was also in the express checkout list. Hey, here's things that your colleagues have, right? So clicking through, you would have found a list of, of your colleagues and drilling into the colleague you then see a list of the access that, that that colleague has. So again, these are rather going, cutting it in the other way. So rather than attacking by requestable item, attacking by my colleague. So if I work with Gert Jan and I know Gert Jan has got access and I don't, I can very easily get to this point, request the access that Gert Jan has that I don't have that's likely to help me and then move through to you know a very efficient uh, remediation of that problem get on with my job right which is which is what we want to achieve 
the, the third point here is, I call them here access bundles in, in Identity Manager, they're referred to as request templates. So you can see choose a template. So it's really bundles of access that are probably relevant to me. So if I work in finance, the finance bundle is going to be relevant. It's a little package of requestable entitlements. It's not, and you might say, well, what's the difference with a, you know, a role here? The difference is it's a much less formalized concept. It's easier to put in place. As we know, some organizations in their maturity you know, curve of identity access management are not quite there yet. So let's recommend a little bundle of access. They all go for approval. So it's all audited, tracked, manageable in terms of renewals and you know, unsubscribing, et cetera, but very easy for the requester to get the access. Let's switch persona now to the approver. I've got a bunch of approvals that I need to do. Identity Manager already offers some good information around risk that you know, can be associated uh, historical information, perhaps if any of these entitlements were involved in compliance violations, it's something to consider. But maybe, and this is something that's that's available in, in the product right now, let's, let's make a recommendation to the approver around what the system thinks, right? So you see here, the system has put an X, thinks that's maybe not a good idea. I mean, it's up to you, same as the human being. It's up to him whether he brakes or accelerates in his autonomous self-driving car. It's up to you whether you click approve or deny. But the system, you know, based on, again, in this case, peer group analysis, uh, I'll explain how it works in a, in a minute, uh, is saying, yeah, that's, that's probably not on balance. Here's an example for an attester, right? It's always thinking about the persona, right? So an attester, identity manager says, yeah, that, that kind of looks okay. Probably Isham should, based on my analysis, have accounts payable access, right? So what's behind this? Why is Identity Manager giving these recommendations? You can see that part of the workflow as the automatic work, the workflow, it's automatically calculated a peer group evaluation for that entitlement based on people like, that's right, the, the, it's, it's based on the recipient rather than the requester. The requester could be your manager, right? So the person who's going to receive the access analysis is, is directed. So sometimes it will it'll say it's good, sometimes it'll say it's bad. Of course, you can, can tune the, the threshold. So really a situation here where the system is starting to make recommendations to the requesters and so on. Perhaps for a certain low risk access, you're willing to let the system make the choice itself. You can do that. Um, you know, my feeling as was discussing earlier is that it's still early days with this technology and, and that most customers will rather go for, hey, recommend this and let me decide. An exception approver. So what kind of recommendations can, or you know, guidelines will the system put in place for an exception approver? If I log into Identity Manager as an exception approver, I've got some work to do. Potentially, I can validate, you know, approve, deny, but I can also resolve violations, and that's a very powerful capability. And so, the exception approver is going to be interested in, you know, what is it that I have to resolve? How does the person get that access? And what's the impact going to be if I move in along this workflow and actually, you know, remove that access uh, from from the person? And of course, identity manager, thanks to some it's it's origin of entitlements you know it's knowledge about why you have the access knows that it knows how to actually remove that access in a correct process respecting way it will be aborted in in the first case it'll be just deleted because it was a direct assignment in that case and those recommendations including you know loss of entitlements information are all available in in the product to guide and recommend a, a behavior and of course ultimately allowing the approver exception approver to make his own decision but we're guiding him in that way based on all that analytics that's that identity manager is running in the background um in terms of an access recommendation what about the role administrator persona the role administrator is interested in you know, classically role mining, have a look at all the entitlements there and recommend roles that, that I can that I can create uh, to, uh, you know, uh, group those entitlements together and make everybody's life easier, make it easier for requesters, for role, you know, role owners, you know, manage that access in a, in a coherent way. So you can have a role owner, but you can the entitlement owner. So it gives you that separation. So there's all good reasons to, to do this kind of thing. And of course, Identity Manager has this capability uh, to do this kind of role mining. Um, it, we also, I would like to mention that if you look on our integrations page uh, on 
uh, oneidentity.com forward slash integrations, then you will find in there integrations with, with other analytic systems where we can bring the roles in, import the roles from another system that's specializing in that. So we have an integration there with some some technology partnerships where, where that kind of integration has been done. So that's an option as well. Uh, in terms of access, moving on to access insights, same question. Okay, access insight, who's it for? Who's going to benefit? Auditors will be interested in having an insight into access, the what, the when, the why that the access has been has been granted. Auditors, business owners of roles, of permissions, of, of organizations are going to be interested. And what I'm going to look at here is that question of show me, you know, show me star by star, show me roles by department, show me risk by request, show me request by approver, show me request by location. There's all different ways to cut the data. An identity manager makes it very easy as a standard to get that data out of the product. All you have to do is to think about who you want to show it to and what precisely that star value should be, and the data is there for you. So audits, here's an auditor persona. He's interested in what, who, and why of access. So here's an entitlement. It's called CRM, right? Some some entitlement in the system. What is it? It's an entitlement. Who's got it? Simon's got it. Why has he got it? Little shopping cart because he made a request that went through and was approved, right? Here's another entitlement. What is it? It's a it's a it's a business role. Who's got it? Simon's got it. How did he get it through dynamic uh, membership? Like all this all this information, analytical information is available. You know, a standard in in the solution that has been for uh, many years now. And it's interesting to see some uh, other vendors in the market suddenly discovering the why of access and, and making a big fuss about it. Perhaps at one identity, we don't make enough fuss <laughs> about about what we do. And, and perhaps that's, you know, we should do more of that. So fuss, I'm making a fuss. <laughs> so it is an entitlement. It's an AD group, as you can see. Who's got it? Simon's got it. How did he get it? It's a direct assignment. Direct assignments are nuanced. Was it a direct assignment from identity manager or was it a direct assignment insofar as it was a discovered direct assignment from a native system? Now that information is available, not there, but it is on the, the accompanying sister screen. You can tell whether that was a direct native assignment or a, a direct assignment within identity manager, which is a, you know one step closer to being acceptable, although any kind of manual action is is something to be, uh, well, to be kept, that, that deserves to have an eye kept on it. Uh, right. Uh, let's uh, move on then from the auditor. What about uh, star by star type considerations, right? So auditor business owner, they're going to love things like, mm, what about requests by location? Who's making the most requests? Oh look, it's the it's the annoying uh, UK crowd. Uh, they're making so many requests for stuff. It's, it's good to know, right? And then of course we can drill down in the solution to find out who they are, who are making the, what are they making requests for. So that's that's really interesting my information. Just another example of star by star. So risk by department. Where are my riskiest departments in terms of the you know risk uh, as it's aggregated by identity manager? across all the access that the identities in that department have. So you can see the red stuff, the riskier ones, the ones with more critical access, the access that could cause more harm. Like that's that's the meaning there. And of course, we can drill down again into that. So identity manager, we've had these capabilities again for many years. Here's a question. How many customers are really exploiting this, this very powerful risk information in, in the solution, in your experience, right? So if we were at a real Unite conference, I would pose that question and then I would really hope people would come afterwards or we'd have a discussion about that. But that's that's certainly something. How are, and if they're not making use of this type of risk information, why would we think they would make use of any other kind of fancy machine learning generated metrics that we're gonna put there in the product? Okay, so I'm just asking this question. I think we should be making more use of these kind of metrics that are available, the ones I'm showing here. Perhaps we're not doing as good a job as we should at articulating the value to our end customers around this. So there's something to think about. Here's another star by star, role by department, but rather than in a heat map format, 
it's coming to us in this kind of nice navigable, uh, you know, graph format that I can navigate through. So I want to cut my business role and see where it's being used, this usage information. Where is it being used across departments, across locations, across call centers, uh, and so on. And, and, and I can look at this very easily and say, well, that doesn't seem normal. Why would people in sales need access to my developer? business role that's kind of odd to me right so any kind of anomalies being surfaced there it's super useful information um where how could we go a step further with, with with this right how could we you know have this pop up in in an alert right to say hey rob it doesn't seem normal to me the system that people in sales would have access to your business role is that the next step as a metrics to, to go for you know i find it interesting that once you start to look at and just think a little bit about the metrics the product is making available, you immediately start thinking how you can go that, that one step further. Uh, here's another information uh, for a role administrator. Standard reports will be standard in 8.2, but if you need a copy, you can get that now. So it's a little preview here. Uh, similarity matrix, right? It's kind of like role mining. Again, could be a help desk uh, use case. I say role administrator. It could be a help desk persona. Hmm. I'm getting a call from, uh, you know, from Rob because he has no access to, you know, to this system. What his colleague does is is working fine, right? So let me do a similarity matrix to see what what exactly and where the differences are. Maybe I just need to align them, right? So so that's 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 really nice nice kind of report that's again just below the surface and we'll be shipping that as standard in, in the not too distant future so just to wrap up on this what what would i say about uh, you know futures here or, or takeaways oh dear it's all mucked up i think the important points are identity manager provides a lot of analytics goodness that i've been showing you know here some of it we've had for a long time some of it is relatively new the peer group analysis and the use of that in the web portal is is you know something that you know may have hopefully a particular interest uh the the thing then is once that you have a look at the the metrics that are available let's think straight away in a persona sense i think is is very helpful if you think differently let me know i think cutting it by persona is really helpful this type of profile what is the data that's interesting to them? And then asking that question, what is the data that's pertinent? That speaks to, that's relevant to that persona. And every customer will have some way of thinking about the data that they would like to specifically see. And all we've got to do is the usual identity manager paradigm, copy, paste, modify the, the, that existing data, those existing reports, that existing metrics, and get it up on the web portal for those personas and and have them you know have that information right at their fingertips that's that's super super useful and it's the whole point of of, of this you know analytics uh, machine learning direction that we're taking define our kpis know what they are are they you know and of course it's at all different levels operational applicative you know in terms of access risk related the people here people talk about rpis i think risk performance indexes right how am i doing on risk um and and so you know that's that's something that we we could work at you know you can't have a system automatically make things better if you don't first have a measurement about what it is that you're trying to improve right so it's got to start with the definition of kpis and again i would i would you know claim that we're still somewhat immature in our rollout of this type of project around defining KPIs and, and we, I think we need to do a better job there. All the more so as it will feed into these machine learning type uh, futures that we have that will hopefully allow us to improve the KPIs you know, over time. And uh, there's lots of metrics there. Let's pluck the low hanging ones. Let's take advantage of the out of the box uh, functionality that's already there to, to give most value to, to you know, in our projects and to our customers. So I would say, just to finish on this, uh, let us know if, if you have thoughts around metrics, if you have ideas at your customers for adaptive automation or access recommendations, things you think are missing that we're really open. I'm certainly open to having a chat with you. Just get in touch, you know where we are. And, and that would be, I think, really interesting you know, way to move forward with this. So with that, thanks for your attention and your time. Uh, I hope it was useful and let, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Goodbye.